Welcome everybody to the January 2024 general meeting of the Minnesota Astronomical Society. Hopefully you are ready and happy to be looking for astronomy things and galaxies and solar eclipses and anything else that would make your heart content for this year and season because I'm looking forward to the solar eclipse. So I am proud to present um, the background which is Jesse's from Deer Camp. The background. <laughs> yep, Jesse just got here. But I, I, I stole it. I stole it from her because I thought it was a really good, really cool picture of the Milky Way and um, the trees and stuff. So it's kind of like my wonderful thing. And also we have. Um, our current board, we have me, Trina, your president. Um, we have returning John Simich for vice president. Secretary is Dave in the house playing with the lights. <laughs> and we have Matt here playing with the electronics uh, for our treasurer. We have Ahmed Reda uh, there. Um, and then we have Jesse. Welcome, Jesse. Yay! Um, welcome, uh, new members. We have 19 new members this month, along with two that have been coming back to us. So thank you very much for joining our wonderful group. Is there anybody in house that's new that's on the list tonight or online? So we can say hi and welcome. If you want to just throw it in the chat, that would be great. So we can do that. So um, otherwise, hopefully everybody that's, that's new, um, you know, if you have any questions about doing anything, feel free to let us know. So we're here to help you. Oh, and our membership is 694. So we're, just, we're holding steady. So that's good. Yep. There we go. I know. I can't wait to hit 700. People, have your friends join. Come on. <laughs> Even for like just a few months, <laughs> you know, just please. <laughs> I would like to hit 700. That's the goal this year This for 2024. What? Yeah, right after the business meeting. That would be great. <laughs> we'll get the quorum and then we can, everybody can join. So that'll be perfect. Yep. Yep. Good plan. Um, next month um, events, we have our sunrise and sunset. It's um, getting a little less dark and a little more light as the months go on. Um, and we have a meteor shower, another one. Uh, quadranid, quad, quadranid, yeah, that's okay. Thank you, thank you. It's like our constellation names. I can't say them. <laughs> um, and then we have, of course, the new moon on the eleventh, day after my daughter's birthday, and um, then we are back here on February first with the last quarter moon right after. So hopefully, we'll have some clear skies at some point here. So we can see some of these things. Um, I thought what was interesting on this one is that, um, where is it? Mercury was going to be close to Mars on January 27th. So I don't know if anybody likes doing the um, two in a view or um, close conjunctions, I guess. Check that out. See, see if you can get some pictures for that. That would be wonderful. All right. And then Antone, I could have you come up here. Talk a little bit about our loaner scope program, which he does so wonderfully, and you take care of everything so well. Okay, like just like I say, every month our our members can borrow one of our eighteen, soon to be nineteen instruments. We have binoculars, we have Dobbs, we have Smith Cassegrain, we have refractors, we have a solar scope. Um, last year we had eighty nine loans. Um, in total, and our first loan for this year went out last night. Oh, wow. so so on our way. Anyway, um, members can request a telescope by going online to under membership loaner scopes, and there you'll see a list of all the scopes we have. There's a form to fill out. The form comes to me, and I'll respond to you. The procedure is then that you meet me at my home in Vadnais Heights, and I. Um, give the telescope to you, show you what you're taking home with you. You sign a piece of paper promising to take care of it and return it after a month, and we're good to go. We also have 
um, um, great courses, DVDs that are available. These, these are vastly underused. So if, if there's any topics up there that you find interesting, um, you can certainly borrow them. Now, nominally, the loan period for these is also a month, but frankly, I know that no one can, can finish one of these in a month. So if it takes longer than that, that's okay too. And I think that's what I have for loaner scope. Any questions on it? Nope, and I don't see anything online either, so. Oh, well, they do. Okay, yes. Uh, yes. Um, we just acquired a pair of Orion 25 by 100 binoculars. So now we'll have two 25 by 100 binoculars. I haven't quite put it on the um, loaner list yet because I'm still collecting the accessories for it. I need the new budget so I can buy accessories for it. <laughs> so once again, everybody come next month so we can approve the budget for the loaner scope program so we can get those set out and everybody, I mean, get everything really well taken care of. So, and I'm keeping Anton up here because he sent me something I thought was really interesting. And so he can talk a little bit about um, this particular object. Okay. Well, you know, Trina likes to put <laughs> astro images from club members up. So I thought I would just send her something that was a little different, some spectroscopy images. And I didn't know that I was doing a presentation on it until I walked in here. It's like those nightmares where I'm on stage and I don't know my lines. So <laughs> we're doing improv tonight. This yes, is this, this is all improv. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, exactly. So here we go. Um, this is RR Lyra. And um, I did this oh, a couple of years ago at Cherry Grove. And for those of you who like the technical aspects, I'll run through that quickly. It was an eight inch F5 Newtonian on a just a clock drive, very under, um, uh, under spec equatorial mount that did surprisingly well. Um, each of these spectrum represent four second exposures of 20 minute long videos that were then stacked in serial. And so what we're doing here is RLIRA is a, a variable star, a short period variable. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And it's changing, its spectra changes over the course of the night. So I started about 10 o'clock at night and just kept doing these videos over and over again until dawn. And you can see it's changed and I'll, 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 I'll describe what the changes are in just a minute. But um, the, the star itself is a little less than a solar mass, like 0.65 solar mass. It's, it's evolved off the main sequence. So it's already exhausted its, its helium, excuse me, its hydrogen core fuel, that's gone. And so it had a helium core. It, it moved off the main sequence and moved up the red giant branch where it was burning hydrogen around the shell of this inert helium core until it got to the top of the tip of the red giant branch. When, when now there was enough helium raining down on the middle of that star that the helium ignited, boom. Well, we don't actually see that because it's deep down inside the star, but the helium ignited. And so now it's on the horizontal giant branch, which means that it's burning its helium core. Um, eventually it'll, it'll, it'll exhaust that. And then it'll start to move up the asymptotic giant branch where it will alternately burn shells of hydrogen and helium as it puffs off um, clouds or, or parts of the atmosphere on its way to becoming a planetary nebula and a white dwarf. But right now, it's in that horizontal branch and it, it varies over a period of about 13 hours over the course of a day or uh, twice in a day really almost. Mm -hmm. And um, what happens is when the star contracts, it heats up and the hydrogen and helium in the atmosphere ionize and that makes it opaque meaning the radiation can't get out, so it heats up. And the gas heats up, it expands, and then it cools. When it cools, the electrons recombine with the nuclei that they separated from, and it becomes transparent again, the radiation escapes, and it contracts. Now, I happened to catch it, and it did, this was just dumb luck. Uh, I think that night, I, I happened to start observing it just as it passed the peak of its brightness and it was starting to, to, to decrease all night long. So it was expanding. Um, the most prominent thing is this peak here. This peak and this one and this one, these are the hydrogen balmer lines and which are characteristic of 
A-class stellar stars. Um, and so when it's at its hottest and its brightest, it's a, what we call a late A star. So it'd be like an A7 or an A8. And then as it expands, you see the Balmer lines, those hydrogen lines become fainter. And it's, it, as, it, as it's changing its spectral type to a type F, a late F. And then, of course, it was dawn by then, but if I could have kept going, I would have seen uh, I, you know, it, it go back the other way as it, um, as it cycled back to the top of the chart there. So it'll keep doing that. Um, these types of stars can be used as standard candles. They kind of like the, um, the Cepheids can, but they are inherently fainter, so they're not as useful at great distances. There are a couple other things on here too, but at the resolution of this, this, this is really a very low resolution spectra. Um, it's hard to see, but there are a couple other things in there that are indicative of this change from type A to type F star as well. So there's my science lecture for the night. Thank you. Yes. Oh, okay, the y-axis, it's, it's arbitrary. Um, yeah, so all of these spectra, they are normalized. They, they're they not normally even flat like this. I, I normalized them all just so, and then spaced them just by an arbitrary constant just to do that, that's all. Yeah, entirely arbitrary. So really all you're looking at is the relative differences. Cool. Yeah. Yes, yes, each, each one of those represents a 20 minute video. So I, I, would, I, I would do 20 minutes cut it off, start again. There's a gap in there where I had to do my meridian flip, which on an entirely manually operated equatorial mount took me a little bit, a little time, but yes. Um, but every 20 minutes I would just start over again. Cool. Do you have a question, Rebecca? Cool. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> All right. Anyway, well, thank you very much. Spectroscopy is fun. All right. Yes, it is. And it does it earn you one of those pins that I it see did. on you? It, one of them. Yes, it did earn one of those. Yes. Yeah, he's got a lot of bling. He's got a lot of bling. And I think I think you're close to Jerry. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. See? People send me cool stuff. I don't always make you come up and talk, but this was really interesting. So don't be afraid to send me pictures. <laughs> All right, uh, upcoming star parties. Well, we don't have any because it's cold and cloudy and the sun is not visible. So we have uh, January 20th, the BSIG winter presentation by Mike Shaw. Um, do you know the topic that he's going to be? Okay, come on up. I'll take the phone. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, Mike Shaw, as you guys may know, is a phenomenal landscape imager. Who, who's been through one of his courses or has worked with him on stuff in the past? You know, yeah. just a few. He, was, he was also here a couple of months ago, too. So Yeah, it's true. He didn't mm -hmm. do a presentation here. And he's spoken to the BSIC before, but I asked him specifically to come this winter to prepare us for the solar eclipse in, in April. So I'm really excited about this. Mike wasn't able to come tonight, so I'm just going to really quickly read uh, a paragraph from what he said. Uh, Michael give a real-time demonstration of creating your plan for photography for the eclipse using the Planet Pro app and Stellarium. Uh, he will also demonstrate how to edit uh, your total eclipse images using Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop and help provide ideas for your totality projects. Uh, Michael have on hand a variety of solar eclipse filters and other accessories to demonstrate. And there'll be plenty, um, ample time for in-depth uh, questions you guys may have about the eclipse. So who's planning on going somewhere for the eclipse? I think this would be a good presentation. <laughs> so again, the presentation is on January 20th at one o'clock and it'll be via Zoom. Um, does anybody have any questions on it? Nope, sounds good. And that Zoom link will be on our homepage and on the calendar. So everybody will be able to find it. Um, and let's see, a public service announcements, announcement for Clayton is that the if you ordered the Observer's Handbook, he has them here in-house. So stop by at the back of the room to pick yours up. Um, otherwise, contact Clayton by email or on the forum to arrange to get yours picked up. So um, anybody else have a public service announcement? You do. You do. All right. 
Mr. Dave Faulkner, everybody. Hello, everybody. Oh, my. Hello. Um, so my public service announcement has to do with Da Vinci Fest and the Candlelit um, uh, Ski uh, event. So Da Vinci Fest that we have attended now for, I don't know, like six years or something like that. It's a combination uh, science fair and exhibition that's at the Stillwater High School on Saturday, January 27th. Uh, runs from about 11 o'clock or so in the morning until about four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we have a table there where we, you know, spread our information on there. And we usually have two telescopes there to show people and um, and just uh, make a have a presence there for everybody. And we're going to need volunteers for that. So if you are available on January 27th and can join us out there at Stillwater High School, I would appreciate it if you would either respond on the forum because there is a post on the forum or Lila or myself, and uh, we will coordinate with you. And if you could bring a small telescope, uh, what we'll, we'll only need two. I, I can bring mine, but we'll need one more telescope to show people, preferably something in the Dob side. Mm. Small Dob would be nice. I don't have a small Dob. <laughs> like six inches? Maybe eight? <laughs> We're specifically focused on the January event. And uh, also they have a, a hayride, which will run regardless of whether or not there's uh, snow or not. And uh, they stop by the observatory and drop people off. And if the sky is clear, we open up at least part of the observatories there to show people things in the sky. If not, there'll be some sort of talk in the, in the classroom. And uh, so we'll need some people to help out with that as well. Again, I, that's also in the forums. So if you just uh, uh, go to the forums and tell, the, the, you know, put in there that you're going to be able to attend that. That's uh, an early event. It starts at 4.30 in the afternoon and only runs to like 8.30. So it's not like a late night thing. So it's uh, pretty easy to do. Any questions? Did I cover it okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, yeah, that's that's the challenge. You, uh, you, have, you, have to, you have to leave early to do that. <laughs> so that's, that's a haul. That's a haul. I've done it. I've done it a couple of times. The other thing is they're going to invite you in the next couple of days. I will get volunteers. Don't worry. We'll We'll be there. We'll have a presence there. And if we have too many people... What we'll do is we'll do shifts and we'll have like somebody like from 1130 to 230 and 230 to 430 or something like that. So, uh, yeah, so don't be afraid to sign up. We can accommodate you. And let me know if you have a smaller, smaller reflector, like or, or refractor telescope. I, I, I've got a Schmidt cast screen. That's what I'm bringing. So if you if you have a different type of telescope, we'd like to have two different types of telescopes there. So. OK, that's it. Thanks. Cool. All right. And since I forgot to split the slide until now, uh, Eclipse countdown, 95 days from today. So um, start planning if you haven't already. Uh, buy your glasses now. Um, and yeah, just be safe out there. Um, and then, of course, member badges. If you are a new member and you need, a, need to request a badge or want to request a badge, there are forms in the back of the room to request that. If you are a current member and don't have your badge with you, please stop by and take it home because um, it's been around for several years and we, we kind of want the, uh, the sheet to be a little lighter to carry around and um, we might end up mailing it to everybody just to get it off Chris's back. <laughs> so, um, and plus, you can always try and get a lanyard, so then you can, ha you know, put your bling on there. So, which I will talk about the bling next, um, which is from the Astronomical League. 
Um, so that is how you earn all of these. You um, Astronomical League has an observing observing programs where it gives you something to focus your night of observing to win, not win, complete uh, um, the list and get a little pin and a certificate. Um, so it's really kind of cool. It's a great little goal. And um, eventually it does get a little heavy, but that's okay. I'm not there yet. Um, and um, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions about it, you can always contact Jerry. However, I do have, I don't have any certificates. We never, we always used to do these in person and handing out the certificates and making people talk about it. And that would be one of you. So here we go, awards this month. So thank you everybody who did something last month. Yay. Um, Steve Kohler, um, is he here tonight? Okay, well, he um, completed his Messier list and got his certificate in pen. Dave Tosteson, I don't see him in the house either. He completed the Bright Nebula, so I don't know anything about that. And I don't know if anybody else does about doing that particular program. And then there's John Simich, who is the head honcho with doing his outreach with uh, at the stellar level, the Observer Award, and the Northern Constellations. So you get to come up and talk a little bit about those, if you wouldn't mind, please. So yay! Yeah, the um, this is, I'm not you know tearing things up with all these things up here. I've been working on these for years and years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It doesn't take years and you know, years, but, but it can. If you look at anybody with all the bling on you know, uh, any people who are engaged in the observing programs, the Astronomical League, you're typically working on 10 things at once. Uh, at least how, how I Just use five. it. Oh, five. Oh, I've only got five okay. going. Well, it depends on what, what the weather conditions are. If you're at home or if you're going to go take a trip somewhere or do whatever, I tend to look at whatever is available. And then... I just go out and observe and then, oh, hey, this goes in, into this program, this goes into that program. And I just I just looked at, uh, in fact, well, the Hades, uh, I've looked at it several times, but uh, I just went out last week. I looked at it with binoculars and that's in three programs. That's I did it. The main reason I was doing it was the urban. I, I have about a dozen things left on that to clean up. And so they're all the winter things, by the way. But um so I looked at that, and that's in the urban, that's in the Caldwell, and that's in the binocular deep sky. So, uh, and basically, one of the main things to do when working on these programs is make sure when you're doing your logs, you're doing logs that can qualify across programs. Most of the logs is just location, date, time, uh, what the sky scene conditions are, what instrument you use, the magnification, and a description that mm -hmm. you know 90% of the programs that'll cover it uh, there are specifics where you get into if you're going into globular clusters or something like that where you have to describe the type of globular cluster double okay. stars if you're doing binocular just clock position is fine if you're doing the AL binocular, or not binocular AL double star program you need position angle so you need the and degrees. you have to sketch up Pardon me? You have to sketch them too. Oh, yes. And you yeah. also yeah. have to sketch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some things you have to sketch, some things you don't. So if you know what you're doing along those lines, you can knock out a couple at a time. But uh, the outreach is just a combination of observations. The Northern Constellations was the uh, program that I finished that then qualified me for to get the or the observer, rather, the observer. Uh, classification. So that's kind of what's happening here. And the stellar outreach, anyone can qualify for that. I, I bet half the room in here has already qualified. I'm kind of slow, but um, once again, but uh, it's just, what what are you doing for outreach programs? You go out to ELO a number of times and help out out there and boom, 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 you'll, you'll get, go go through those quite a bit. Uh, my main thing that with outreach, I run a program at an elementary school and we meet once a month. And that's where a lot of my time goes into that one. But Excellent. 
Well, and if you're interested in doing the outreach, um, the Da Vinci Fest, you can log that. You can do the candlelight ski event. You can do the Bell Museum events. You can do the Bee Sig events and um, go out there and help with people and talk with people. Of course, ELO. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of different things that you can do to kind of work toward that. And I think you yeah, I, I know you get a certificate for the first first level, and I think you get a certificate for the third level. And I think at one point you get a pin for first and third, which is the last. So I'm on the middle one too. So, yeah. Oh, okay. I haven't gotten a pin for the second one yet. Anyway, that's all right. We'll we'll compare notes later, and it's all online. You just go to the alleague.com and or .org and it, it's, it's all there. So if you have any questions, reach out to reach out to Jerry or anybody on the board, we can, we can certainly help you out. And of course I miss him. And what does he say? Get out there and observe. Good job. Should we try that again though? <laughs> um, Gemini articles, it, the deadline's coming up. Um, talk about everything that you're doing, what you're working on observing programs, how you've enjoyed it, tips and tricks, um, outreach, anything. Um, Father Brown loves having articles from the membership because that's the only way that he publishes a newsletter. There are no outside sources. It is all through the membership. So we love hearing about you and your adventures. So please keep giving him um, documentation and stories. Um, or anything. So January 10th, it'll get published in February and March 10th, it'll get published in April. So, and it goes to Gemini at mnastro.org. And of course, we have the more current event happenings, which Mr. Dave Faulkner presents to us every week when there's something to talk about. So if you have something you want um, announced, like Da Vinci Fest and volunteerism, it, put it in there. It'll get out to everybody. Um, and if you haven't signed up, let us know. And we'll get you signed up for that. All right. And then next meeting, which I know I have the right date, February 1st. It is the first of the month. It's 2024. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> I fixed it. I swear I fixed it. All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll fix it in editing. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Well, I would just want to be last year, all right? Last year was cool. I was just starting out, too. Um, but that is our... It's right on the website, all right? Since I have a little note here that says everything for 2024 is correct and on the website. So don't believe me. Just go out there and look. Um, and then uh, next month is going to be Vaults. He's going to... Of course, I will talk about it. Back then. Okay, so February is our budget meeting. It's a business meeting. Um, we need to have a quorum to pass the budgets for LLC, all of our sites, um, all of our loaner scope programs, all of the little programs along the way that are not part of the sites, um, everything. So it's going to work the same way as we did for the elections. And that will be, you'll have to register. Um, once you hit into Zoom, you'll have to register. Go to your email, click the link in your email, and that will log you into the meeting. So that way we have everybody recorded as far as membership so we can re-verify to make sure we have a, have a full quorum. Um, and then we will vote. Same thing with the poll and ballots online or yays, nays in-house. Um, and of course the poll online, yes, no, approve, don't approve, you know, that kind of thing, have problem, send us an email later. Um, and yeah, did I cover it all? Okay, cool. So next month, call your friends, make sure everybody has joined, not joined, um, knows about it, gets to the meeting, logs into Zoom, does your thing, any questions, let us know. And it's 2024. I know, and I'm hoping that at this point, Professor Robert Lys Lysak? Lysak is here to, from the Minnesota Institute of Astrophysics. I know it's a little bit early in the night, so if we want to take five minutes to get him all set up, he will be talking about Jupiter's aurora. So head on back to the back of the room for a little bit and um, get your books. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. We are ready to go. Um, we, let's welcome Professor Robert Lysak with a round of applause for showing up tonight. So thank you very much. In person is good. And the floor is yours, sir. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation to come here. Um, I was just thinking, I, I've, I've spoken to you before. Uh, I can't remember how many years ago it was because it was just before pandemic. That's just, you know, a period that we all don't remember. Okay, there we go. And one thing I remember when I, when I was talking about the Earth's aurora, and one thing I remember in the questions, which were all very good, uh, someone asked about the aurora and other planets. And it just so happens in the intervening time, uh, I've been working largely on the uh, uh, studying the, the aurora at Jupiter based on a new, uh, well, relatively new mission uh, called Juno, which is in orbit around Jupiter, which is somewhat, uh, I, I kind of feel like it's a, a small stepchild or something. Everybody everybody likes to look at pictures from James Webb Space Telescope, which is the image of Jupiter that you're seeing right there, uh, and you know, talk about a lot of other fancy missions. But Juno kind of gets lost in the in the shuffle, but it's actually a really exciting mission and a unique mission and probably the only time we'll ever get the sort of data that we're going to uh, see, uh, that you'll see here. Um, of course, I work with a lot of people, Ali, Sadie, I think Ali Suleiman has been here talking about Saturn and Sadie and Yan are both at Minnesota. Uh, Fran Bagenal, who, who graciously gave me a lot of slides that I'll use, is from Colorado. And uh, Barry and Georgia from APL and, and, and Bill Kurth is from University of Iowa. So, so Juno is a satellite, it's provided the first uh, direct measurements of of Jupiter's aurora. It's the first satellite that we put into polar orbit around Jupiter. All of the other Galileo, of course, uh, it was in a more equatorial orbit. The Voyagers and the Pioneers, of course, just shot right by and and got a little bit of data, but then went on to further reaches of the uh, of the solar system. And and of course, there's there's a lot of similarity uh, between the Earth's aurora and Jupiter's, and but of course, a lot of differences too. And so I'll try to uh, illustrate some of those in this presentation. So, so here's here's sort of the classic picture. This is the one John Clark who took this who took this picture probably wishes he has a nickel for the time for every time people have shown it because this is the one everybody shows because it 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 illustrates the sorts of auroras that we see. This is an image in the ultraviolet. It's around a, a, somewhere around 100 nanometers. I have, I have this, the lines listed before. And there's, it shows a couple of these important parts of, of, of Jupiter's uh, aurora. First of all, there's this very, well, it, lo it looks like a very nice ring. Kind of gets messed up over here. I'll talk about that as well. Um, that's what we refer to as the main oval. And as I'll, as I'll mention, uh, this is actually associated with the rotation of Jupiter, with the, with the fact that Jupiter is a, a rapid rotator. Uh, so that that part is is not too dissimilar from the Earth. Uh, the other thing we'll talk about too is there's these emissions in the polar regions, and at the Earth, the polar regions are generally pretty dark. If you go too far north, uh, you go north of the aurora, and you don't don't get to see it anymore. And then the other thing that we absolutely have no indication of at Earth is that Jupiter has large moons that are relatively close to the planet. Uh, Io, which is the most important of these, is a six Jovian radii, uh, of course, which of course is our yardstick for looking in the magnetospheres, uh, multiples of J Jupiter's radius. And, and Io produces an aurora of its own. And not only that, that has been well known for a while, but, but it also has this, this elongated tail, which we're finding more and more about uh, with the Juno mission. And in fact, Two of the other uh, Galilean moons, Ganymede and Europa, also have footprints, although for various reasons, which we'll get into, uh, they're, they're not quite as, as uh, distinct as, as those of Io. So let's, let's uh, uh, there's gonna be a little bit of physics in this talk, but I'm, I know you guys can handle it. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, and of course, we'll have any questions. Um, just to compare with Earth, of course, the Earth's magnetic field uh, surrounds the planet and gets blown back by the solar wind into this uh, almost comet-like like shape. And uh, there's very, of course, we know a lot about Earth's magnetosphere. There's been 
dozens of satellites that have, have studied these various regions here. And, and we know that on Earth, the auroras in these, in these polar regions, it's associated with what we call field-aligned currents, which are electrical currents that flow along magnetic field lines. So, so you know, particles, if, if you remember your, your physics, uh, a, a charged particle will do a spiral around a magnetic field line. So it tends to follow those field lines. And these currents are associated with the electrons flowing through there. And so since the electron is negatively charged, regions where the current is upward away from the planet are regions where the electrons are coming down. And so those are the regions where you tend to see the aurora. You know, protons and other ions produce some aurora, but the, the electrons are the dominant feature. So we'll compare this picture with Jupiter as we go along. And here's here's a, 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 a an image showing uh, the not only the uh, uh, magnetosphere of Earth, not just a slice through it, but also Saturn and Jupiter. The the Im these images are scaled so that the the where where the uh, the front end of the of the uh, magnetic field, which we call the magnetopause, is a balance between the pressure of the solar wind and the magnetic pressure of the magnetosphere. And at Earth, that's about where the magnetopause sits. It's about 10 times the radius of the Earth. And, and this dashed line sort of indicates where these other planets would, would do it. But Saturn and Jupiter, as you can see, extend their magnetospheres extend far beyond those that, that balance point. And the region is the reason is that both Saturn and Jupiter rotate rapidly, around ten hours, and they they trap plasma into a, a disk. You can see it very well here in, in Jupiter's case, where which extends the magnetic field lines out, and and that causes the magneto magnetopause to extend outward. So this is one of the first clues at Earth, as as we'll talk about more. The solar wind interaction pretty much drives everything. That's one reason why we're seeing, you know, some pretty good auroras in the past year or so is that we're right now near solar maximum, where where uh, there's a lot of magnetic activity. Jupiter, in particular, uh, se seems to not be so sensitive to the solar wind. It's more the the aurora there is driven more by its internal dynamics, by by this rapid rotation, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. So. So uh, what about Juno? Juno is a mission that was flown by NASA. Uh, it, it's, uh, of course, the thing with all these planetary missions is that you you uh, have to launch them well before you're going to start getting data. So this was launched way back in 2011. It got to Jupiter. I don't know why. They always seem to arrive at planets and do very big, important things around the 4th of July. I, uh, NASA's very clever this way, I guess. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, Juno has a lot of a lot of uh, goals, uh, they're, they're talking about Jupiter's atmosphere. You may have seen pictures from the Juno cam, which shows a lot of the turbulence and other exciting things in Jupiter. It also uh, can has a, a, a what they call a microwave radiometer that can look deep into the planet and observe what's happening in the lower parts of the uh, of the of Jupiter. And it also is uh, flies very close to Jupiter which means it can get very good measurements of the magnetic field and the gravitational field of Jupiter, which are all important uh, parameters. But the part that I'm gonna, oops, the part that I'm gonna talk about is, is this fourth goal, which is to study the magnetosphere near the poles and the auroras associated with those. And so, of course, there's been a lot of, of, of work that's been done on that. And as I mentioned before, uh, my colleague, Fran Bagenal has provided me these slides or not all of the slides, but some of them at least. So here's a picture of, of, of Juno. It's a solar powered satellite. Uh, so it has these, these big uh, solar panels going off. It has, has uh, measurements. Of course, it has the, the cameras, Juno cam, UVS, which is the ultraviolet spectrometer, which is very important. I'll show a lot of data from that. And gyram, which is the infrared spectrometer. Some of the Jupiter's aurora that turns out to be in the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, another thing that our group in Minnesota does a lot of work with is, is the waves instrument, looking at various radio and plasma waves. And then there's other particles, other measurements of particles. Uh, they, they come up with great acronyms, of course, at NASA. JEDI is the Juno Energetic Particle Detector Instrument or something like that. 
and Jade is the Juno Auroral Distributions Experiment. Uh, the magnetometer is just called MAG. They're, they're kind of uh, not very creative. And I mentioned this microwave radi radiometer uh, that measures the microwaves. So this is the satellite. As I say, it's been orbiting Jupiter for quite a while. And this is, this is a, a scenario of the, of the orbit. It's in a highly elliptical orbit, which comes very close, uh, comes, comes less than one, uh, less than one tenth of a Jupiter radius to the planet. So it's very, very much skimming over the clouds. Um, and it was supposed to go into uh, an orbit that had an 11 day orbital period, but that, that part didn't work. That was gonna be the, the original plan but at the beginning, you know, you're you're out there uh, far away at Jupiter. You can't really change things too much. Uh, and they were, there were some valves that were showing malfunction. And they were worried that if they tried to change the orbit, which requires firing the rockets, that something might go wrong and the whole thing might either crash into Jupiter or go flying off into space. So they decided a better plan was to just uh, not do those burns, let the satellite stay in these larger orbits. And actually that turned out to be a good, a good decision because for one thing, those orbits are, are take a lot longer to do. And so that means there's fewer passes through the radiation belts. And those are the, the radiation belts are what, what kills satellites, right? That's uh, well known from st uh, studies at earth as well. Uh, the other thing that it does is it extends the orbit out uh, well out into the solar wind so we can measure that magnetopause of Jupiter and, and its interaction with the solar wind. And, and, uh, and of course, since the orbits were taking longer, the mission in terms of human year years is, is continuing, in fact, still continuing to this day. So here's, here's a, a, again, a little bit more, uh, more uh, NASA uh, buzz stuff about this. And, and what happens at Jupiter, as we'll mention, there's there's a current, electrical current system. I mentioned those field aligned currents. Uh, and, and, Ju and Juno, this is kind of almost a scale sort of picture coming very close to these regions where, where we think that the auroral particles are accelerated. And if you remember my talk from the last time, uh, we, I pointed out that, that this auroral acceleration tends to pl take place relatively close to the planet. It's not way out in the tail somewhere, it's, it's very close. Uh, only a few thousand kilometers up. So this is the whole thing. So, so let's look at, at, at uh, Earth and Jupiter and, and see some of the contrasts. Again, here's that famous picture. So John gets another nickel. Here's another famous picture of Earth's magnetosphere from Lou Frank at the University of Iowa uh, from an earlier satellite. And uh, again, some of the differences is that, is that how is the aurora driven? At Earth, the aurora is mainly driven by the solar wind interaction. At Jupiter, it's mainly driven by the co-rotation. I'll talk a little bit more about that. The other thing we'll mention is that there's two different types of electron distributions. This is getting into the weeds a little bit. In some cases, all of the electrons come down with basically the same amount of energy as if they all just passed through a, a potential drop and gained a lot of energy. I used to say this is like a, like a TV, except TVs don't work this way anymore. You know, the old old TVs used to have an electron gun that would shoot uh, and hit the screen, and various phosphors would glow the different colors. Uh, nowadays, of course, it's all solid state and all that stuff that doesn't have anything to do with plasmas. So I'm not interested. Um, uh, but in addition to that sort of thing, there's also a wave, what's called broadband or wave acceleration, uh, and and this is this is a a, a type that's uh, that I'm actually very interested in because that's something I've been doing a lot of work on. And, and both of these types of, of acceleration occur at both planets, uh, but at Earth, the monoenergetic produces most of the, most of the auroral light. Whereas in Jupiter, it seems that this broadband acceleration is, is more important. Another fact that's sort of related to that, as I mentioned, the upward current is downward electrons. And so that's where you expect the auroras to be. But, uh, but that means in the downward current region, which where the electrons are going up, and as I said, the protons don't do too much, uh, you, you don't get any auroral emissions. And you can see, for example, in the, in the polar cap of, of Earth, uh, in, in there's, there's very little going on. Sometimes there's, there's some that sneak in there, but that's another special case. But, but in, in, at Jupiter, even in this, in this downward current region, we still get auroras. In the, 
The reason is, is because of this broad, this broadband acceleration is, is, is bi-directional. It's, it's sort of, it's sort of like, like shaking a, a, you know, shaking something up and down and some particles go up and some particles go down. So even though the, the net flow of current, net flow of electrons is up, there's still enough that are coming down to make aurora. So that's, that's a, an interesting factor. Uh, and again, again, this polar cap emission may be of this sort, but the polar cap is very different at Jupiter, as I'll mention again as we get into there. Uh, at, at Earth, this one reason it's dark is that it's connected out to the solar wind where there isn't much plasma. Whereas in Jupiter, we think it's still dis debated, but we think that the polar cap is actually closed, that, it, that those magnetic field lines don't go into the solar wind. And so that's, that's the other story. And of course, then... The other major difference is that is that uh, our, our moon doesn't do much. It's way it's way too far out to uh, really uh, interact very much with the magnetosphere. Uh, it does a little bit, but but for the most part, it doesn't produce any auroral signatures. Whereas as as we saw before, Io and Ganymede and Europa can can do such things. Okay, so just some differences. Some other big differences, of course, Jupiter's big. Right, it's it just just take everything on Earth and multiply by about ten times. It's about it's the, the radius is about ten times larger. Jupiter is a, a spinning ball of gas, so it's very oblate. Its its equatorial radius is is something like five thousand kilometers larger than its polar radius, uh, whereas the Earth is relatively solid, and there's there's only a very different, uh, very small difference between the polar and the equatorial radiuses. Uh, of course, Jupiter is uh, uh, a few hundred times heavier, and it also rotates once every 10 hours or so, as opposed to 24 hours. Uh, one funny thing about that is that even though we're so used to 24 hours, is that when we when we measure what we call local time at Jupiter, it's still measured in 24 in 24 hour things, even though the rotation period is 10 hours. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Uh, <laughs> The magnetic field is again about ten times bigger. Uh, it, it, the, the Earth's field is is on average about a half a Gauss, and and Jupiter's is is something like ten or uh, five or ten Gauss. Uh, the tilt of the dipole, the magnetic the magnetic axis and the rotational axis, are not aligned at at either Jupiter or Earth. Strangely enough, they are aligned at Saturn, but but this isn't to talk about Saturn, so we won't. Won't mention any more about that next time. Yes, um, when we have a satellite that's going there. Um, and of course, the other thing is, and now here's here's a plot from a, a, a I forget what what this projection is called. You've seen this for global pictures of of Jupiter's uh, magnetic field strength, and you can see that it's that especially in the north, it's very irregular, and there's some very strong uh, regions here where the field's up over 20 Gauss. There's this, this interesting spot down here in the southern hemisphere, uh, which, is, which is somewhat confusingly called the great blue spot. And, and people will think, oh, you know, th might start thinking, oh, it's like the great red spot. But the only reason it's blue is because of the color scale that they picked to make this diagram. So, so uh, yeah, it's still a, re a region of anomalously large magnetic fields. So that's of interest as well. But the, the other thing that's important for our, for our aurora story is if you look at these polar uh, plots, uh, uh, here again is the magnetic field strength, and and the 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 lines drawn on there are the average auroral ovals, and you can see because of this big this difference between the strength of the magnetic field uh, in in this region and that region, uh, the aurora becomes distorted. So it's very easy to tell whether you're looking at the northern or the southern uh, auroras of Jupiter. The southern aurora is almost a perfect circle. Uh, the Earth's, the, the, the northern aurora is kind of this more bean-shaped uh, type of, of structure. You'll see examples. Okay. Well, what else is different? Well, what, the one thing that's also different is the co composition of the atmosphere. Of course, the Earth's, the Earth's at atmosphere is is uh, got lots of things, nice things like oxygen and nitrogen in it. And those produce very nice, beautiful colored spectral lines. Like the green line and the red line are associated with oxygen. Some of the blue uh, emissions are associated with nitrogen, and there's a little bit due to uh, due to protons. But at Jupiter, well, there's and, and of course, oh, the other thing I should mention 
the energies of the particles are something up to it's sort of the 10 kilovolt range. At Jupiter, Jupiter's a big ball of hydrogen. So Jupiter's atmosphere is, is, is hydrogen, both in atomic form and in molecular form. And in, for the atomic hydrogen, you see the Lyman series. Uh, I know we're looking at the L.L. Leary and see, seeing the Balmer series, which is the next highest up. Uh, this is in the, in, in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. The mo molecular hydrogen, H2, uh, has has various bands. The composition of those spectra are a lot more complicated, but these emissions are around 100 nanometers, uh, which is uh, in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And so, so Juno has this ultraviolet spectrograph that is right in, uh, focused in on that range, 68 to 210. And here again, you see an image of the northern kind of bean-shaped aurora. And the southern one, unfortunately, sometimes part of the spacecraft gets in the way of the image. Uh, that's, well, nothing you can do about that. Um, the other thing that, that, that uh, is uh, very interesting, I, I may show some more of these, is that they often plot this in terms of the ratio of, of about 160 nanometers to 125 nanometers, which turns out to be dependent on the, the energy of the particles. Because the higher energy the particle is, the further down in the atmosphere the, uh, the, the electron will get before it loses its energy and creates the light. But so, so, so this, this can tell you what's, what the images is. And of course, you see a lot of this is white. And of course, the white means all colors, right? That's all the colors blended together. So, so those are regions that are, are likely associated with this broadband type of acceleration. So again... So some people say, well, Jupiter's aurora is actually kind of boring because uh, it doesn't have all those nice little colors that we have at Earth. But the other thing that's interesting is that Jupiter has aurora in the infrared as well. And there was an instrument on, on, on Juno to study those. And now here we're talking not about nanometers, but microns. And, and uh, again, you see some very, uh, you tend to see very uh, nice detail with these infrared instruments. Uh, and, and this is a good thing. But the interesting thing about these, uh, th these emissions is these are associated with an H3 plus ion. And now I'm not sure how much chemistry you all have known, but H3 plus shouldn't exist. It's three protons held together by two electrons. And you'd think something like that would fall apart uh, very easily. Uh, but it turns out, so we say, yeah, who ordered that? It turns out you can create H3 plus from uh, interaction between hydrogen molecules and ions. And it, if the plasma is cold enough and if it's dense enough, and these conditions seem to be uh, present in the ionosphere, it can live for, for, a minute, for a few minutes long enough to get, your, your, uh, uh, get a spectrum out of it. Uh, this, this is a technical term I read in one of the papers. This molecule is floppy. Uh, which means that it, it creates a lot of vibration and rotational lines. And, uh, and, and those are the sorts of, uh, this is the spectrum that you would see from that, from that uh, structure. All right, well, just to think a little bit more about the physics, uh, we have this theory which has an imposing name of magnetohydrodynamics. And as uh, the great Man Randall Monroe uh, point out, this is just another word for magic. And, but actually, it's a very simple theory. Because it's, it, it really boils down, I don't have to show any equations, it boils down to some simple topics. One is that magnetic fields have pressure. They can push on the plasma. I mentioned before that the magnetopause is the balance point between the plasma pressure of the solar wind and the magnetic pressure. Uh, another thing that it has is magnetic field lines in a way act like wires. They can, they can, they can shake. And in fact, you can... You can uh, on Earth, we, we have a, a study, what we call magnetoseismology, where we diagnose the density of the plasma on a field line by at what frequency it shakes, just like different guitar strings have different uh, uh, pitches. And these waves are called alphane waves, and I'll mention that term, so, so you'll hear that one before. The, the final concept that's important is, is, again, should be familiar to Minnesotans, is the uh, frozen in condition. And what that means is that in a highly conducting plasma, magnetic field lines move along with the, the plasma. So if, if the plasma flows uh, around, then it, 
it will carry the magnetic field uh, with it. And so that's, that's the important point. And so this tells you something about how these auroras are generally created. At Earth, what happens is that the, the solar wind is, is going past the Earth. There is a process called magnetic reconnection, with, which intertwines the Earth's magnetic field lines and the, and the uh, solar wind magnetic field lines. And it drives the plasma and the magnetic field uh, away. This is, this is noon here and, and midnight there. So this is the part towards the sun. So, so over the polar cap, we have it, the flow goes away from the sun. And then, it, and then it returns in what's called a two-cell convection pattern. And it turns out, again, if you do the math, anytime you have a, a rotation like this of, the, of this convection, that's a place where you're going to look for currents. And so this, this uh, uh, diagram here on the right, uh, the, the lighter colored uh, uh, shows the currents coming out of the uh, ionosphere and the darker th th those that are going in. So this is the sort of picture that we think of in terms of Earth. At Jupiter, there's a whole other thing. Ju at Jupiter, the, 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 uh, the, the, the planet rotates very rapidly, and it enforces rotation on the plasma around it, and it carries the magnetic field lines around, as I was saying before. This actually happens at Earth, too, but only out to about four or five Earth radii. At Jupiter, it happens to 30 or 40 jo Jovian radii. So, so a large part of the inner magnetosphere of Jupiter is, is whipping around every 10 hours. And that, of course, requires some forces to keep it going. And when you go, when you go further, and those forces are provided by the magnetic field. But when you go far enough away, the magnetic field becomes weaker. In fact, you even have to try to make it move even faster. And eventually that breaks down. And when that breaks down, the, the current, uh, a current has to flow. And that's sort of illustrated here, here in this in this disk region, uh, which I mentioned before. The, the, this outward going current is the current that's uh, helping to provide the force that keeps the co rotation going, and currents have to form closed loops for the most part. So here the current flows inward at the polar region and outward in the more equatorial region, and that happens that happens all around the planet. At Earth, there's a difference between the morning side and the evening side of the magnetosphere at Jupiter. At Jupiter, it's all the same. So this is this is another big, big difference, and why we see that that uh, nice. Oops, what are we doing? There we go. Uh, nice, nice types of of uh, of uh, an oral oval. All right. Now let me mention again. Here, here we're getting really deep into the weeds. Uh, uh, so you can space this out if you don't if you can't uh, don't want to, th to think about this. But when we talk about monoenergetic versus broadband, uh, this is a plot of, of data from Juno, uh, and and uh, what's plotted here is the uh, number, basically the flux of electrons, the intensity of electrons, as a function of their energy. And here in this in this image here, you can see that there's a big peak. This is, you know, this is a factor of 100 from the middle point to the top here. So that's it's a big jump. And that's what we mean by the monochromatic acceleration. It's almost as if all of those electrons have fallen uh, through the same potential. But then as this, uh, as this system goes on, uh, as, you, as the satellite passes through, it transitions to this very flat sort of broadband acceleration mechanism. And so this is the part that's associated with with, uh, with actually with these alphane waves I mentioned before, you can see this one, two, three, four correspond to these places on the spectrogram. So this is time and energy, and the color indicates the intensity of the electrons. And these peaks, these monoenergetic peaks, tend to, tend to increase in energy and then go back down in a structure we call the inverted V. And so we see, we see this sort of structure associated with, with that. And oops, problem with using the mouse here. And then some of these later structures, you can see that that all energies are showing up all at once. And and this this plot down here is is the angle that the particle is making with the magnetic field. And the fact that these are are observed from all different angles means that the electrons are going both up and down the field lines at, at the same time. So there's so so you think of think of some oscillating 
accelerator that's shooting some electrons up and some electrons down. And this happens at Earth, too. And, and this is a, another image from a satellite called FAST that I did a lot of work on in the, in the early 2000s. And, and we see this, this sort of inverted V type of structure uh, and, and then a broadband structure later on. Notice the difference in scale, though. This is, this is 100, 100 kilovolts and a, up to a million volts. At Earth, we're talking about 10 kilovolts or so. So again, everything's an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 bigger. So, so this is the, this is the uh, that, that's the most complicated slide, I think, there. So, but what you're all here for is the pretty pictures. And, and, uh, and now I wanted to talk about, about Io, the moon Io. And this picture here, oops, where'd it go? I keep doing this. This picture here is, I guess I, I thought I put a label on it. This is hot off the press. This was released by NASA, I think, yesterday. And, and this uh, Juno just passed uh, Io very closely, about 1,000 miles away, and took this, this image of it. This is an earlier image from Galileo, which was at a similar, similarly close distance. This is a good one because you can see this little plume here. That's a, vol that's a volcano erupting. And, and that's what happens all over here. And in fact, these dark spots here, you can see here, and there's one here, one here. Those, those I'm told, are, are lava flows from previous volcanoes. And so you see that, that Io is this, is this moon, you know, sometimes it's called the pizza moon, right? It has, has all of these, these, uh, this volcanic activity that goes on. And, and that activity has a big effect because the, the, the volcanic eruptions release a lot of sulfur dioxide into, the, into Io's atmosphere, and that gets us dissociated and ionized and creates sulfur ions and oxygen ions. So that's very distinct from the hydrogen seen in the ionosphere close to Jupiter. So these, are, these heavy ions are, are uh, very important. And then they make, they make a, a, what's called a torus or donut of plasma, that surrounds Io's orbit. Again, remember Io is about six uh, Jovian radii from the planet, and 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 it creates all of this plasma that you can actually image uh, with the instrumentation. But the other important point is that this, again, remember this is all in this rapidly rotating environment where 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 there's there's centrifugal forces that basically cause those ions to populate a disk of plasma. That was alluded to in some of the earlier pictures. So, so the so Jupiter is upside down in a way because at Earth, the plasma sheet, the outer magnetosphere is largely hydrogen with some helium, and the ion and the ionosphere is oxygen and nitrogen. At Jupiter, the ionosphere is hydrogen, and the outer outer magnetosphere is 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 in this case sulfur and oxygen. Uh, I don't think there's very much nitrogen there, but tough. Uh, and, and again, this is this is the this is sort of the uh, the effect of this of this plasma. Uh, if you, the, this plasma is basically carrying out this this region here that's shaded in and carrying uh, which carries currents as well, and that leads to a modeling of the uh, of of the uh, of this magnetospheric structure. And in fact, one of the things that I do is 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 model the propagation of alphane waves. And alphane waves, which usually go at a speed of something like a thousand kilometers a second, uh, approach the speed of light in Jupiter. Again, everything's bigger and more exciting. Uh, so, so uh, that's that's another important uh, aspect to it. But the other thing now is that Io is this is this moon. It's it's got all these gases, all these gases around it. It's a relatively strong conductor compared to space. And if you move a conductor through a plasma, through, uh, through a magnetic field, it will generate currents. And it generates uh, what are these so-called alphane wings. It's sort of like the, the path that comes off, off a boat when you're you know, speeding down the, across the lake. And, and except, electro, except it's an electromagnetic uh, effect. And, and, that, and those waves can bounce around in this in this plasma torus region, and there they move relatively slowly because it's very heavy, and and the speed depends on how heavy the, the plasma is. But then it goes into this region where it's near the speed of light, and it just goes zinging down 
to the to the uh, uh, to the to the jo Jovian surface. And you can see here, for example, in this image, you can see this tail is not just a smooth tail. It's got different spots in it. And that, we think, is where these alphane waves come and they hit, keep bouncing around and hit the, hit the atmosphere. If you look at the infrared, you see there's even more detail in this. This is another image. This, this, is, the, this is the main spot of, of Io. And this is this, this whole tail. And you can see there's almost this zigzag pattern in here which we're still trying to understand. I thought I understood it at one point and then, and then I improved the model and it didn't work anymore. But uh, it's the way science goes sometimes. But, but anyway, it's, it's, it's an intriguing uh, feature of these. Uh, again, here's some more examples. You have this sort of a wiggly uh, thing going on here. And, uh, and again, this is all from the infrared from those floppy H3 plus molecules. And in fact, this, these tails can go almost all the way around the planet. This, this, this is an image 100 degrees in longitude around, in other words, over, over a quarter of the way around uh, there. Yeah. So could these uh, nodules and all that, could be caused by interference patterns of the alpha great waves and, and, and uh, the magnetic? It's, it's kind of like that. I'll show you, I'll show you my, uh, my example of it yeah. before. It, but it is due to the fact that different waves are coming in at different times, which is the same thing that, of course, gives you interference. Yeah. Oh, this is a horrible slide. This is this is just some details. It's got equations. I thought I thought I'd gotten all the equations out of here, but <laughs> no, nah, equations are wonderful. <laughs> and uh, basically, what these equations just say, we're treating Io as a big ball of conductivity since it's. Well, it, it orbits around Jupiter once every three or four days, but of course Jupiter's spinning past it every 10 hours. So it's really it's really the motion of Jupiter's magnetosphere past Io that's causing all of this, uh, all of these these uh, structures and generating these currents. And and so here's here's the getting into stuff that I've done now. This is this is a result of some of the modeling that that we did, and uh, what what we what we're doing here is we're we're taking Io right here. Io is at sort of the peak of this, of this point right here. The colors indicate which way the wave is going. So the red means it's going north, and the blue it means it's going south. And again, you see these sort of interference type of patterns going forward. And it depends on the density. So, so if the density is, is, is lower, these spots come closer together than if it's higher. And, and uh, various other things that you can see going on, all these little partial reflections at the border of the torus. All this stuff is really, really kind of fascinating stuff. And you see a lot of different structuring going on here. But if you, maybe I should go back a second here. If I go back to this picture here, you notice that, that Io, the orbit of Io is not the same as the orbit of the, the structure of this torus. Uh, which depends on on magnetic field and and uh, centrifugal effects, and so sometimes, uh, let's see here, sometimes uh, Io is near the near one side of the torus than the other, and that's what we're plotting here. So this is this is about as far north as Io gets in terms of I should mention this is in terms of magnetic latitude, not regular latitude, and you see all these structures. And one thing you can see better in this picture. There's all this little stuff going up and down in here, mostly going down. And, and we think that this is the sort of stuff that's, that's associated with those wiggles that we see in, the, in those images before. So this is, this is the story of there. And of course, nice thing about computer simulations is you can make movies. And so here's, here's Io just trucking along, uh, minding its own business, shooting alphane waves around. And, and you can see how they kind of move slowly near the, near the equator and then move more rapidly uh, in the, uh, as they get closer to the planet. And so this is, this is what I burn up my, our supercomputer time doing. Actually, it doesn't take up that much time to do. Yeah. The, other, the other moons do have the same sort of effect. Now, you don't tend to see this, this big, these, these long tails for those. You see the primary, the main spot from, the, from this. But of course, the, the thing is, is Io is making its own plasma. It's shooting up all, all that stuff, which, which keeps it going. Those other planets don't really have those sorts of emissions. Europa 
might be shooting off some water. You know, there's water geysers and things there. So there might be some of that. But they're also further away from Jupiter than Io is. Uh, which is maybe the main thing that's that's associated with it. And what that also means is that their spots, if you remember that first picture, are closer to the main aurora, so they kind of get lost in the main aurora. So that's that's another another part of it here. Oops. And I never figure out how to get to stop making the movie. There we go. But anyway, you see, you see, this is some more pictures from our simulation. You see that there's all of this structuring, which which uh, uh, you know may or may not be associated with those those wiggles that we see. Uh, there's actually some real data too. We we have we have some passes where where uh, where Juno has gone through this structure, and you see this uh, magnetic perturbation, this alphane wave going through here, and we see this sort of structuring as well. Uh, there seem to be more structuring in the real data than in the simulation, which which is not too surprising because the simulation is is pretty uh, pretty simplified, of course, as, as most computer simulations are, uh, compared with the real world, of course. All right, let's see. We're getting a long, little long on time. I should I, let, let me let me uh, skip a little bit of this stuff. Oh really? Oh, that, oh my gosh! You want you, you have enough you have enough engine, attention span for that though? Right. <laughs> yes. Or does it, is it locked? Is it yeah, Io is tidally locked. It's rotationally all, all of the moon, all of those moons are, are locked. They only, show one side. they only show one side to Jupiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a bit of a tilt. The, the The torus is centered on what's called the centrifugal equator, because if you take the magnetic, and again, you have to remember that the magnetic field is not the same as the spin. And so there's a point on every field line that's the furthest away from the plant, from the rotation axis, and 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 so that leads to a tilt that's that's uh, about. It actually, turns out at small angles, it's it's two thirds of the of the actual tilt between the magnetic field and the and the rotational axis. So. So yeah, that so so they're not quite aligned, which is which is one reason why we do those other. Simulations because Io's orbit is more or less in the equatorial plane of Jupiter. Okay, well, well then, if you're gonna let me run a little bit more, uh, I'll talk. Another uh, important point is that plasmas tend to uh, create the electric fields that can accelerate particles when the density is low. There's a lot of particles around, and you know, you, the, the the system wants to have so much current flowing. It's easy for the particles to carry that current, but if but if the if you start taking away all the particles, pretty soon there's nothing left to carry the current, and that in that case, the these these electric fields will form. That's a consequence of Maxwell's equations, and and what we found is that in the auroral regions, as you get towards the pole, the density becomes really low. I mean, at Earth, the dense in the Earth's magnetosphere, the density rarely gets below about one particle per cubic centimeter. Here at Jupiter, it can be a hundred or even a thousand times smaller than that, and and in fact, this has been evidenced in a couple of different ways. One is that the waves in a plasma are uh, ha have characteristic frequencies associated with them that de that depend on the density of the plasma. In fact, it's called the plasma frequency is proportional to the square root of the density, and so if you can measure those waves. And see where that cutoff in the wave frequency is. You can make an estimate of the of the plasma density. And my colleague Ali Suleiman has has done this sort of work, as well as uh, uh, his colleagues. Obviously, nobody does all this stuff alone. And and we get this measurement of the waves. Uh, and as you go towards the poles, the density is dropping down. Here, the density is ten to the minus two per cubic centimeter at the bottom of this plot. And this is where the auroras are starting to happen out in here. So, so this is a, a key feature in all of this, uh, in, in how to how to form the aurora at these at these cases. The other thing that's interesting here is that the the uh, colored dots in here are measurements from the particle instruments. So the particle instruments, you might say, oh well, that's the way to find the density. Just count up all the particles. Well, no instrument measures every single particle, so that's a little bit. Uh, of, a, of a sketchy thing to do, but in this case, it works out perfectly well. The, 
the, these, the, there's an excellent agreement between the wave measurement and the particle measurement of the density, which gives you confidence that the particle measurement is measuring the uh, uh, most of the plasma in this case. So this is, uh, uh, and there's, there's more data here that also shows these, this polar cap region is very low in density. Well, why does it, why does it uh, go down? Well, one simple explanation is that when you have aurora and you're accelerating electrons downward, you're, always, you're also gonna accelerate ions upward and that leaves a hole behind. And this, this cartoon here on the top was one drawn for Earth uh, at the FAST satellite by my colleague, Chris Chaston, and, and sh showing evidence that that's exactly what happens. And that seems to be happening at, at, at Jupiter too. This is another set of data from Juno with the particle measurements. In this case, it's the electrons and this is the ions. And when the electrons become broadbanded like this, the ions disappear. It's a really very a close correspondence between these two. And so this, this, this gives us some pictures of that, that this sort of pic, this ah, gives us some evidence that this picture is, is reasonable at this, at this point. So the final thing I actually I had here is to talk about the polar cap. And as I mentioned at the, at the top, uh, the polar cap has, has these emissions in them. And uh, there are also regions where the current is downward, so they shouldn't have any emissions. The other thing that's really strange, and I don't think I had the data here, but the, uh, the particle instruments see, see these sulfur and oxygen ions, remember our friends from Io, that are being accelerated down towards the planet at energies of a million volts. And, and that was totally unexpected. Nobody thought that was going to happen. And so that's, that's a, a real new uh, uh, aspect of things that was uh, discovered by, by Juno. And so, so and, and this is a, another picture of these red, the red curves on these diagrams, again, northern and southern uh, hemispheres indicate these regions where we see these large potential drops. And so this is something that we're studying in the future of the mission, because as the mission goes on, uh, it's, it's crossing the auroral zone at lower and lower altitudes. And so we're hoping to build up a, an altitude profile of how the auroral acceleration works in Jupiter's polar cap. So this is another, another aspect of things. And so, so finally, this is, this is the point I was making now, actually a long time ago, uh, some people just, just kind of, this is actually back in the Voyager era, uh, realized that these, that these polar cap is a region uh, and, and, it's, and it's tied to this co-rotation and so that there should be some sort of a twirly pattern going on here, uh, coupling to the spinning ionosphere. And, and recently one of my colleagues, Binjan Zhang, uh, did a simulation with Gamera, which I don't remember what it stands for, but it's it's the it's the state of the art of of large simulation codes for for this type of uh, study. And what what he showed is that there's there's a few field lines this are called distant lobe open, which kind of look like this old picture, but most of the field lines in the polar cap are these black ones that actually connect from one ionosphere to the other. And so they never reach the solar wind. The, the solar wind is these green ones here that, that are coming out. And so this was, this was again, something that was, was not really very expected. And of course, this all makes sense because if, if the polar cap, if in the polar cap we're seeing these heavy ions from the plasma sheet coming in to hit Jupiter, uh, those must be field lines that go into that into that plasma sheet region rather than going out into the solar wind. And so so this is this is a story that's starting to become together a little bit and uh, it will again, as I said, be the, the subject of future work. Uh, we're, we're in fact in the midst of two or three papers on the polar cap uh, as we speak here. so well, not as we speak because nobody's working at this hour but, <laughs> except for me. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm about wrapping up here. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, because of the, the change of orbit of Io, uh, of Juno, excuse me, uh, or the lack of thereof, uh, the, the, the mission has lasted longer than people expected. And in fact, uh, that, that uh, induced NASA 
to approve an extended mission. This is usually the way these NASA missions work, is they'll have some base, base uh, program that they expect to get done in a certain amount of time, and then you have to ask for more money to continue the work, because usually by then you're just starting to get excited about it. And, uh, and so, uh, but in this case, they, they thought the case was very good to do it. And of course, you know, orbits precess. And so as, as, the, as the orbit precesses of Juno, it comes to lower and lower altitudes this way. And what happened is that uh, a, a few years ago, it passed Ganymede. And then, and then a, a few years later, it passed Europa. And as I mentioned last week, it passed Io, and in fact, it will pass Io again on its next orbit, which will be uh, at the beginning of February. So, so uh, uh, the other thing you can see here is that as these orbits get uh, extend, they cross the, the polar cap regions at lower and lower altitudes, so that so that we're getting closer and closer into the into the uh, into the uh, so acceleration regions. Various things happen too. Each time it passes a moon, the the uh, the apogee or the apogee, as we call it. Uh, uh, yeah, well, well the, the, these orbits. See, you can see this where it says PJ thirty four PJ. Those are perigees. That's that's the way we label the orbits. Uh, you got to come up with new terminology, right? Just to make things exciting and confuse people. Um, uh, the, the the only the, the problem and the, what's probably going to eventually kill the mission off is that as as it as it moves uh, as it precesses around uh, in this in the in the longitudinal direction it's getting to the point where where the 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 part where where it's close to Jupiter is going to be uh, on the night side behind behind Jupiter and of course as I mentioned before it's a solar powered satellite and so it will lose power during those periods. And of course you can survive a little bit of losing power, but eventually uh, eventually that, that can uh, help uh, kill off the, the, you know, the, the instrumentation. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's also happening too, is that as we come in here, uh, this region in here is radiation belts. And so we're also getting close to the radiation belts and, and they may, they may uh, damage the spacecraft as well. Uh, so, so there's all, all sorts of things that uh, will, will cause this mission to eventually end. And of course, what they'll do, which, 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 which uh, they've already done once with the Cassini at Jupiter, is at the end, they crash it into Jupiter uh, because you, know, you, don't, you don't want us uh, spreading microbes over the Jovian system and, and that would piss off the Jovians and you know, uh, cause, you know, cause them to come out from their shells in Europa or something like that. I'm getting a little extreme here. But anyway, we'll, we'll have this kind of grand finale which, which at Saturn was really exciting because the satellite took data uh, well into the into the uh, body of the planet. So that was that was really kind of kind of uh, a lot of fun. Uh, that that's going to to happen. Uh, well, the, the 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 plan so far is to go until till September of twenty five. So we still have uh, a little more than a year and a half of new data to be to got from, to get from Juno. So anyway, I'm going to. Uh, uh, end with some probably what you're waiting for, but you're more, more, maybe more interested in is James Webb, right? Because that has the greatest images of the cosmos, all of that. And, you know, there's there's that interesting stuff about the beginning of the universe and all that sort of stuff. But it also is taking great pictures of the, within the solar system. And this is an image, one of the first images that came out from the James Webb of of uh, of, of Jupiter. Uh, you can see the the auroral regions here. You can see some of the inner moons, uh, Adrastea. I don't even know how to pronounce that one. Amalthea and Jupiter's rings. In fact, it, it's it's so bright here. You can see this little diffraction pattern from the aurora. Uh, the other thing that's that's interesting here is that that this is this is the red spot. And you might be saying, "Hold it! Doesn't look like a red spot." But remember, James Webb is an infrared telescope. And so, so anything that's red is going to look white in this in this false color image. So, so that's that's another interesting thing. The great the great thing about this this photograph is that it was released last in, in July of 2022, uh, while while most of us were at a meeting in Belgium 
studying magnetospheres of the outer planets. So, so one morning we walk into the meeting room and there was this beautiful picture of Jupiter sitting there and everybody was standing there with their jaws uh, agape. But, uh, and and uh, other, other moons have been, or other planets have been seen before too. Here's, here's a picture of Uranus uh, out there with a few of its, a few of these are moons. I'm not sure which ones are moons and which ones are stars. Uh, you know, Uranus is funny because it's tipped on its side. It rotates like this, not like this. You know, so so the rings of, of Uranus are, are all, and I won't make the obvious jokes, uh, are, are all in this plane here. Right now, the pole of, of Uranus is pointed towards uh, towards the sun and towards the Earth. Uh, of course, Uranus has an orbital period of 80 years, and in about 20 years, it'll be pointing sideways, which is significant because NASA has just approved the study of a, of a new flagship mission, you know, which is their name for the biggest missions to go into orbit around Uranus. And so, so that will probably, I, I will be really lucky if I can stay alive long enough to see it because I'm getting on there because, because that's probably not going to be till, till the 2040s at the very earliest that we'll actually get, get to Uranus. And of course, this, this other picture here, this, this is Neptune and Neptune's a little bit more, more normal, but it's also got a weird magnetic field. And, and so those are always also interesting things to study. I don't think there's any planned mission to go to, to Neptune uh, anytime soon. Uh, and of course, uh, I, should, I didn't put a slide in there, but I should mention there are a couple more missions going to Jupiter. Uh, one which has already been launched is called JUICE, which is the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer. That's going to mainly look at the moons. It's going to go into orbit, in fact, around Ganymede, which is the moon of Jupiter that has a, its own magnetic field. And uh, so that's that's coming up. That was launched a couple of years ago, and we'll get to Jupiter, I think, in about 27 or 28. And uh, then there's also a, uh, a, a another satellite. that uh, JUICE is largely a European mission. NASA has a mission called the Europa Express, which is, as the name implies, going to focus on Europa because you know Europa is the one that has the subsurface ocean and uh, potentially some some sort of signs of life. So those are the those are the sort of things that are coming up. So so here's here's the family photo photo. Uh, these are the web images of the of the four giant planets. And uh, with that, I'll uh, take your questions. Yeah. Get away from that microphone. Yeah, the Zoom, the Zoom, <laughs> the Zoom meetings. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned early on how with respect to the Aurora, uh, the magnetic fields up there are closed. I think that was the word the term you used, mm -hmm. closed. But we also know that Jupiter's magnetic tail, the magnetic field is, is very dynamic, right? The magnetic tail goes the magnet. I think called the magnetosphere. It yeah. stretches all the way past Saturn, right? It goes all right, the way out right. there. So are you saying that those two are distinct from each other? Or are they there was one operate within the other one? Uh I'm I'm not exactly sure, to tell you the truth. I mean that could that those field lines could be just extended that that far and and uh and then still eventually come around and get get uh, uh come back to to Jupiter. So uh you know that that's that's something that's hard to do because you know you can't paint a field line and and uh, and follow it like I can in the simulation, right? You can uh, you, you, if, you, if you have two different places, you can tell some things by saying, like for example, that we're seeing these heavy ions there, so it must be coming from that region. But uh, yeah, what, what's happening in the tail, in the distant tail? I'm I'm not sure about. Sir, did you have any <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> no, you need that. <laughs> in the um, uh, polar image of the aurora, there's an anomaly in there that you were going to talk about. Mm -hmm. What's that uh, little tick thing in, in the in the in the oval, the the northern? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, where was it? Let's see. Let me find it. Well, it's. Uh, it's yeah, this there. this this bit here, uh, yeah, right. that that where, where it kind of breaks there, yeah, right yeah. there, right in there, yeah. Yeah, I, I pointed out in this in this other image that is needs to be a way to go through these things fast. 
uh, where is it? Oops. Did I miss it? There it is. That, that corresponds to this part here. This is this region where the magnetic field is anomalously weak. And, and so that uh, generally, generally that would tend to squeeze in uh, the aurora in that, in that regime. Or as you can see, it's, it's, it's very strong on the other side. So, so that, that little bean shape kind of rotates around with the planet. Yeah. So um, I know that Juno has studied lightning on Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Is there any correlation with the lightning and auroral activity? Not that I know of. Uh, we do we do know from Earth that lightning produces uh, waves that that go into the magnetosphere. And in fact, I think again, this isn't my specialty, but I think I think there have been observations of of the waves in the magnet in the magnetosphere produced by the lightning and Jupiter. Uh, but I'm I'm not hundred percent sure about that. But but I think there is that connection. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's obviously if you give a whole week of lectures on all the uh, interesting in internal stuff of Jupiter too. And lightning is, is certainly one of those. Yeah. I don't know if this applies, but I was under the understanding that Io has like strong Mag magnetopole with Jupiter, and that's why it has all of volcanic activity. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, a a question. Io is in a in an elliptical orbit, as most uh, satellites are, and it's also very, as I said, very close. So, so there's a strong tidal interaction, you know, that that will will basically stretch and, and compress the interior. And so that is presumably associated with the with the heating and the core of of Io that produces the volcanism. Um, again, again, not not my field, but that's that's sort of what I know about it. But, but that's uh, but it is this tidal heating mechanism that that uh, is is thought to produce that. I think there was some over here. Are there any online? Hey, um, now that you got that slide up, um, this may not be your area of expertise either, but is there anything that's been determined about internal structure of Jupiter from the fact that the magnetic field is so lopsided and floppy or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. that? <laughs> well, I know a little bit about this. I mean, uh, one, of, one of the things about, about this is that the, the dynamo region of Jupiter, the region where the magnetic field is being generated, is thought to to be relatively close to the surface of the planet. At the at the Earth, you know, at the, at the Earth, the dynamo is down in the core. I think I think up to about half of the radius of the Earth. Whereas at Jupiter, the dynamo region can can go up to I think something like eighty percent of the radius. So so and, and all of this higher order structure tends to fall off with distance more rapidly. Uh, which is why you see a dipole field mostly at Earth, because because there's lots of if you went went into the core of the Earth, you'd see all sorts of tangled magnetic fields. But all that structure dies out as you go further and further away from the dynamo, and uh, and so so being closer being closer to the generation mechanism implies that there should be that that there would be more structure. Now, why it's exactly like it is, I don't I don't know if anybody really knows that, uh, but uh, I'm sure people are trying to. Do it. Dynamo simulations for figuring out how these magnetic field works have proven to be very challenging, and and uh, and there hasn't been a really good one yet, as far as I know. Yeah. So it's iron in the outer core, the dynamo effect that produces the magnetic field on Earth. What is it in Jupiter? It's not iron. No, it's not. It's it's uh, well, in Jupiter, the 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 uh, pressures are much higher. And and hydrogen can enter a metallic state, where it has some it has a conducting property. I mean, you know, the Earth the Earth's field isn't it is of course the the iron, but it's not like an iron. It's not like a bar magnet. It's it's because of the the fact that that the core is is fluid, at least the outer parts of the core is fluid and, and is rotating around in a turbulent way, mm -hmm. and and so that can happen with this in this metallic hydrogen phase as well. And so that's and that's what produces it. 
uh, at Jupiter and, and presumably Saturn as well. And the field's much bigger, but how about intensity from a Gauss level compared to the Earth's? Yeah, well, the, the, the field at the surface, well, like these pictures show, goes up to about, about 20 Gauss, uh, whereas at the Earth, the field is, is a fraction of a Gauss. And of course, it's even bigger, it's even more than that, because that's at the radius of Jupiter, which is 10 times larger than the radius of the Earth. So if you went, if you went to a distance, the radius of the Earth at Jupiter, you would be, uh, you'd have much, much stronger fields if you actually calculated what's called the magnetic moment, which, mm -hmm. which I don't have off the top of my head. Well, yeah, that's right there. Well, that, that's the, that's the, uh, yeah, well, I wrote it in terms of her RJ. Right. That's a way of, yeah. That that's that's actually some people would object to calling that a magnetic moment to tell you the truth, uh, but I find it a, a, you know magnetic moment should be measured in amp meter squared, which doesn't mean anything to me, but this means something to them. Really. Sure, sure. And one last question: uh, Are there any aurora-like effects on Jupiter that aren't related to the magnetic field? That are that are not not related to the magnetic field. I don't know of any. I mean, there are, you know, at Earth, there's like air glow and, and mm -hmm. various things in the atmosphere. I'm not aware of anything of that nature at Jupiter. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good question. Okay. So we know that the, that it's the uh, the solar wind that interacts with the uh, magnetic field of the Earth. Does the solar wind have any interaction with the magnetic field at, at Jupiter as well? And and if so, what do we see there as far as the influence? Yeah, yeah. The the when I'm when I'm saying that the magnetosphere is largely closed, that basically means that there's limited amount of interaction with the solar wind. There, it, the solar wind does, as I mentioned a few times, exert pressure. And if you're if you're you know if it's if it's like a coronal mass ejection, you know, which is a big, uh, another technical term, a big blob of plasma that comes out, then uh, uh, that will tend to compress the magnetosphere, and that tends to make the currents bigger and things like that. Uh, but it, but it seems to be that that's more of a secondary effect at Jupiter uh, relative to its importance at Earth. <laughs> I have one more question. Do you have one? Oh yeah, I think Mark. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, Mark Linnefelter, uh, try again if you're trying to ask a question online. We'll be back with him. One follow-up. Thanks. So, um, with respect to the moons of Jupiter, mm -hmm. we know that some of the inner moons are are kind of reddish, and one of the theories is that Io's dust is causing some of that. Do we see interaction between the moons themselves that are that are causing various I don't know, either rural activity on Jupiter or within themselves. So, you know, Ganymede's got a magnetic field and things like that. Are we seeing any of that dust from Io causing other problems, essentially? Again, I'm not, I'm not that aware of that because I think it largely becomes ionized before too long. And so it, it populates this plasma disk uh, that's coming out. Um, it is true that Ganymede and even Europa have auroral-like emissions of their own, right, at their own on, on their own surfaces, uh, which of course are not as strong as the ones of Jupiter, but but they 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 exist, and uh, they uh, people have uh, I think there was a recent study of this from the Hubble uh, Space Telescope uh, that has been published recently. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mark, if you want to try again, I, I don't know if I'm, why I'm not hearing you. Nope, not hearing you. Don't know. It's chat or something? Yeah, you can type something, otherwise I'm not sure. Just a moment. <laughs> when it comes through, it's going to be loud. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. No, I think he's typing it, so. It's always one of those technical difficulties. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, well, we have hybrid seminars and colloquia okay. to you all the time and oh, yeah. have the same problems. So Mark commented in, about sound generated by Earth's aurora. Oh, is there a comparison to Jupiter's magnetic field to sound? Like uh, re like uh, resonant frequencies or something like that, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Or... Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, well, I don't, we don't. For one thing, we don't have any audio detectors at Jupiter, which is uh, that that would make it hard to see. Of course, even even sound from the aurora at Earth is a controversial subject. I think I've uh, heard it. You may have heard about this already. Yeah, that some people Seriously. think it's all psychological, and people haven't had have tried to re record it and without success. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, as I mentioned, there are things. That we kind of think of in sound-like ways, like like some of these waves that propagate uh, uh, on closed field lines that kind of bounce back and forth and have their own frequencies. Mm -hmm. So so in that sense, in that sense, there's uh, sound-like things, but it's not it's not the same sort of thing that we're communicating with right now by by pushing air around with our with our breath. Yeah, Mark Mark says he's a ham radio operator and familiar with the sounds, and I'm assuming you know like. RF type noises. Oh yeah, by yeah. Earth's aurora. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no. Certainly, certainly, you would. Yeah, you have that at Earth, and I presume if you had ham radio operators on Jupiter, you would. Uh, uh, you, you would. You would. They would see. The, of course, from the lightning that was mentioned before, and all these other things. Um, yeah, that's always another one of my, my good jokes. At Earth, we have all of this ground-based instrumentation. We have ground magnetometers. We have radars. We can shoot up rockets. Uh, the Jovians haven't figured out how to do any of that yet. He's also just got one additional comment. It's like also thinking about the noise generated when the shoemaker levy impacts. So. Oh yeah, yeah. That, well, that's another whole whole thing. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, there would be there would be wave pressure waves in the in the planet. I think there was actually, there were actually observations of that when when shoot and hit okay. that that there were like ripples that you could see okay. going out. Um, yeah, if, if it was close enough, it might have. Uh, affected the aurora right it could it could so i had a question also uh related to since you were describing the um conductive material in jupiter as being kind of fluidy yeah. it, do they, does it ever do a flip like the sun does or go through you know cycles of anything like that that's a very good question uh and you know, I've learned from giving talks like this. If somebody says it's a very good question, it means I have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe that's not such good. Uh, we don't know. I mean, the answer is we don't know because we haven't been observing Jupiter's magnetic field long enough to Here. to observe. Now we've got about thirty or forty years, you know, forty years of of history. But of course, uh, for the sun, that's that's four solar cycles, but but at Earth, you know, the Earth's field flips too, but that's on scales of millions of years. So there's some indication that that the that the field strength is changing a little bit. What what a recent paper I saw just just indicated that it's actually uh, that the the pole is actually moving, but the author of that paper thinks it's because we don't quite have the rotation rate right, and and so the magnetic field may be more stationary if we actually use the, the correct. Rotation. It's hard to determine a rotation rate when you're talking about a ball of gas. Uh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a lot easier if you have something solid. Yeah, and of course, like I say, so so you know whether in fact you know it's, it's these weird fields as Uranus and Neptune uh, has it's been speculated that that they they may be in the process of undergoing a flip, which is why they look so weird at this point. Well, we don't have any plans for that. Um, well, it would be crushed more than that, I mean, because the pressure becomes becomes higher. Uh, I don't know what you would, you know, I don't know how far you'd have to go down to actually get get stuff. I mean, it's not like a, you know, like a comet or, or an asteroid like they've been do, doing the uh, sample returns where you can, you know, or, or at Mars, we can go around and put it in a cache it somewhere for NASA to ignore for the rest of humanity, but uh, which which it unfortunately is the current uh, status, it seems. Um, uh, I better not get into ragging on NASA because that could we could be here all night then. <laughs> more question. Yeah, okay. So everybody in the room probably has seen some aurora and here we are sitting way down in the 45th, um, is it longitude, latitude? Latitude. Yeah. Latitude. 
I'm looking at that picture. That's probably five degrees or 90 or, you know, 85 degrees. Does it ever get down to the 45th latitude on Jupiter? I don't think so. And the reason I say that is that, is that uh, again, the Earth, the Earth field is largely, the Earth is largely controlled by the solar activity. So when you have a very large solar storm, then that tends to erode the magnetosphere down and pushes the aurora to lower latitude. So, and, and of course, that has to happen in order for us to see aurora at, at our location. Uh, actually, it's, not, it's a little bit better than, than that because the magnetic pole is actually on our side. It's tipped towards us. Uh, you, if you use a compass at all, you know that, that the declination is almost zero, or your compass needle actually does point north uh, in Minnesota for the most part. Mm -hmm. so, so we're actually more like uh, 55 degrees uh, magnetic latitude in terms of the distance from the pole. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one reason we can actually have some hope of seeing aurora. Uh, uh, of course, it always helps to get out of the city, but uh, that was a, uh, let me just share a great story that, that uh, last spring when there were a number of good days of Aurora, I have a, a graduate student from India and he comes in and to my office and says, Bob, I am now worthy to be your graduate student. And I was going, what, what was he going to do? He says, says, I finally have seen the Aurora. So, you know, so you go, hey, way to go. And so, uh, and of course my other, my other story about that is that I, I moved to Minnesota in 1982, and within uh, within one week of of moving here, I saw Aurora from South Minneapolis. Uh, so it was bright enough to overcome the city lights and everything. So I decided to stay. <laughs> and we're glad you did. So <laughs> thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you for press. Thank you so much. Thanks for all the great questions. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I believe this concludes our evening tonight. So if you're interested, let's head on over to Pizza Luce and grab some pizza and beverages. We'll see you on February 1st. All right. 2024. All right. Thank you. Good night.